afternoon and welcome. My name is Sister Pat Murray and I'm the Executive Secretary of the International Union of Superiors General. And I'm here welcoming you all in the name of the two unions of women and men. And we're beginning a process that's very important, both in the life of the church and the life of the world. Uh, there are, it's a significant time. Uh, we only have to look around our world today. We read of and know of and suffer with those who are suffering in times of earthquake and floods and wars and threats of wars and political instability. And yet the church is preparing to gather, to reflect on the signs of the times and to see the calls of today. So as the UISG, we had an assembly in 2023 uh, which had as its theme, 2022, uh, which had as its theme embracing vulnerability on the synodal journey. And I know also the USG had similar reflections on synodality. However, as David McCallan re remarked to me the other day, he said, when we're looking at the theme of vulnerability, it also invites us to courage, and courage in time, in its own time, invites us to resilience. So there are three very interesting words to hold as we start on this pilgrim journey of synodality. Vulnerability, courage, and resilience. Because all journeys are challenging. All journeys bring with them moments of smooth walking and also times when we meet obstacles and difficulties along the way. So these are three important dispositions for all of us because the invitation is to the whole church to walk the synodal pathway. And the two unions are taking this commitment very seriously. First of all, at UISG, we are initiating a three-year process to reflect on the call to be synodal and to embed a synodal way into our way of leading, of proceeding, and living. And we have found someone to lead this process Sister Maria Simperman, and I will say just a little about her as I hand over. It will be a three-year program, and we are inviting all religious, particularly religious women and their collaborators, to undertake this journey with us. And today we're beginning. Uh, it's like all journeys. You begin with a certain trepidation and begin wondering what's ahead. Uh, we may know just the first steps of the journey, but we know that there is a journey to be undertaken. As the two unions, we live unity in diversity. More and more religious life demonstrates what some writer has called a luxurious diversity. And I think we're embracing new ministries, new ways of participating and collaborating with our brothers and sisters. And so the synodal journey begins. And Sister Maria Simperman will be helping us on that journey. She's a member of the religious of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. She's a professor of theology, of theological ethics at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. She will still remain connected with CTU, but also present here in Rome. And for the past number of years, she has been director at Catholic Theological Union for the Center of Religious Life. She has several notable 
publications on religious life translated into many different languages, and I'm not going to list them here. Uh, she's presented at many conferences and seminars. So, Sister Maria and many others will become the face of this synodal journey. So I welcome you, Maria, and hand over to you as we begin today's uh, first step. And it's probably a little different to normal webinars because it's inviting us really to participate in a synodal way. So it's not, it's not a matter of presentations and discussions. It's, it's a call to a different kind of listening and a different kind of participation. So to all who are online and here in person in the room, let us begin together walking the synodal pathway. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister Pat, and it's a delight to be here with you. I um, have always been an admirer of the important work of Consecrated Life and of the work of UISG, so it's, uh, it's a gift to engage this important moment in and time in our church and to do it as women religious and with our brothers uh, and our brothers and sisters across the globe. It's an important time. I'd like to begin uh, with a prayer today, and it's, uh, it's, it'll be the first slide. It's the Ad Sumus Sancti Spiritus, and it's the prayer that was used at the beginning uh, and at each of the sessions of Vatican II, an invoking of the Spirit. And what it does is just remind us that truly the protagonist of all of our efforts here uh, is the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can find it also in many languages on synod.va. And we invite everyone here to, to pray it each day as we anticipate the synod and also in the midst of it. And we have spaces before the second synod session. So if you would, in your own language, um, as you are able, to just uh, pray this aloud. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather in your name with you alone to guide us. Make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance, the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you who are at work in every place and time in the communion of the Father and the Son forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. For our time together today, I, what we will do is uh, I'll begin with an overview and some further background on the Synod Assembly 2023. And then we will have our three panelists engage with us on the first area uh, that will be a focus for the Synod Assembly, and that's the area of communion. And then we will invite the whole group that's gathered uh, those of you who are on Zoom and here, to an experience of conversation in the spirit. Uh, and so we will have directions on that as well. And some of you probably have a lot of experience in it. So to begin, a little bit of the context and then the distinctiveness of this particular synod. It is impossible to overemphasize the importance and profound nature of this time. 
Pope Francis is calling the entire church to synodality, a continuation of the renewal ushered in by the Spirit in Vatican II. Cardinal Tobin describes this time as a new phase in the reception of the Second Vatican Council that recovered the church as the people of God as the central hermeneutical or interpretive criterion of the council's ecclesiology, vision of church, as a particular way of walking together as the people of God, Pope Francis asserts strongly, and you've heard this, it is precisely this path of synodality which God expects of the church of the third millennium. As chapter two of Lumen Gentium reminds us, the church is the people of God, and Pope Francis is not only reminding us that all the baptized are the, are the church, he is also trying to enlarge a sense among the baptized that the baptismal call is to participation in the church through the gifts that each has received from the spirit. The equal dignity participation, and co-responsibility of all is necessary for our church. Grounded in scripture and tradition, the call to synodality is essential to our life and mission. To this end, Pope Francis has convened a synodal process for the entire church to discern how the spirit is moving and how we are called to walk together as people on mission. So it is a way of being and proceeding. The Pope is trying to help the church experience a way of walking together in which the people listen and are heard. Difficult conversations can be engaged respectfully and communal discernment becomes our way for the sake of the gospel mission. He is trying to help us see synodality as the church's ordinary way of proceeding, rather than as simply something reserved only for large decisions in the church body. The International Theological Commission states that, first and foremost, synodality denotes the particular style that qualifies the life and mission of the church expressing her nature as the people of God journeying together and gathering in assembly, summoned by the Lord Jesus in the power of the Spirit to proclaim the gospel. So synodality must be expressed in the church's ordinary ways of proceeding and working. If we can do this, this path of walking together is the most effective way of manifesting and putting into practice the nature of church as pilgrim and missionary people of God. So synodality is to be the specific modus vivendi, vivendi et operandi of the church, the way of working and of operating and of living in the church for this to be the involvement and participation of the whole people of God in the life and the mission of the church is essential. This will require changes of mentality, practice, and structures. To live synodality as we are being called is to move or requires a change from a hierarchical way of leadership to a more inclusive, circular, and horizontal style of leadership and membership. And therefore, synodality requires the grace of conversion. The joy of the gospel actually gives us this hint in saying that, quote, in carrying out her mission, the church is called to constant conversion. And it's a pastoral and missionary conversion. And it involves renewing mentalities, attitudes, practices, and structures in order to be more faithful to her vocation. So here, conversion must go alongside the practices of synodality. And, and the attitudes that go with it. 
So the road leading us to the October Synod. We are now in the second major phase of a synodal process that began in October 2021 with listening sessions, and many of you have probably participated in them around the world. Catholics, people who left the church, people who are, uh, belong to no denomination, people of all faith traditions, everyone was invited to gather and share two pieces. One is, what is your experience of church? And two, what do you sense the spirit is inviting? Now notice, the second question is, what is not, what do you think we should do as church? It actually says, what do you sense the spirit is asking of us as church in this time? And while not exhaustive, every single person did not respond from every parish or organization, responses came from across the globe, not only from parishes and dioceses, but from refugee centers, from online groups, from border communities, from elementary schools, and more. UISG and USG also participated in this process. In fact, it was an explicit ask from the Vatican to submit to the General Secretariat of the Synod the synthesis of the contributions from consecrated life. And we're going to share a little bit more about this in our second gathering on September 25th, when we look at the Continental Assemblies and also what we heard from religious life, from UISG and USG. So all of these contributions came from around the world. And what happened then is that we, a group on the synodal process ended up bringing together uh, and looking at all the contributions and putting together the continental documents, right? The continental documents then ended up going back to the people and every continent was asked to read this synthesis document and say, from North America, from Europe, from Asia, from Africa, from the Middle East, Oceania, from all these places, what resonates and what's particular to your area? So this ended up creating yet another document. And what you're seeing is again, something unique. The listening process, and then it went to the Senate office, and then it went back to the people in continents, and then it went back to the synod. And the group of experts read, reflected, prayed with, and discerned together what has become for us today the working document for the coming synod, the Instrumentum Laboris. So already it's a breathing in and breathing out of the entire church gathered. So it's a powerful space to look at what's been called. And the first session is called the 16th General Ordinary Assembly of the Synod of Bishops. And the topic we're taking is for a synodal church, communion, participation, and mission. Right? The Synod Assembly is about the nature of the church. Who is the church? What does it mean to be church? And what is the spirit asking of the church in this third millennium? Right? And I think we have a few slides here that speak to this coming uh, assembly, if we could have those. Because what they'll do and what you'll see here, could we go back one slide, please? Perfect. The text of the Instrumentum Laboris really looks at what we will begin with at the Synod. And it's the essential, really, elements of a synodal church. Like, what does that mean integrally? And then, out of all the responses from across the globe, three key issues kept showing up. And it's communion, participation, and mission, right? three priority areas as we look at ourselves as church. And the first one is the one we're going to talk about. And it's about a communion that radiates. 
How can we be more fully assigned an instrument of union with God and with unity of all humanity, which then also includes the earth, the oceans, right? The second key priority is co-responsibility and mission. We'll look at how can we better share gifts and tasks in the service of the gospel, right? There's much to be about. How can we use the gifts of all the people of God? And the third key priority is participation, governance, and authority. What processes, structures, and institutions in a missionary synodal church are needed? So we'll be looking at those. Within each one of those, and I do ask you, invite you to look at the working document, under each of those three areas are five questions, right? They go into a little more detail. All the questions come from listening to the people of God. So it's really meant to reflect, this is what you're asking. Let us have a synod to engage those questions. Uh, and then the next slide, please. Perfect. And again, just another image, and these are already found on the synod.va website. It's an excellent website for all kinds of resources. And it's, it shows you that all three are key areas as we look at what does it mean to be a synodal church, right? Now, while there have been synods before this time, there are particular features or elements of this synod assembly that are noteworthy and distinctive. And there are many ways to explain this, but I'm going to offer here simply five areas, and that's our next slide. And I'm going to offer some brief points within each, right? What's notable about this coming synod? The first is about the kind of listening. The working document comes from listening around the globe. It's the first such effort. And the document is in the form of questions not as has been done before, a rough draft of what becomes the final draft. The questions are all there. It is not answered. And that's the challenge and the invitation of the Synod Assembly and the one to follow is to say, what, how do we discern together? It means that listening to one another and the spirit and the cries will be essential. And in order to do this, what Pope Francis calls listening in which everyone has something to learn, periods of silence will be throughout the sessions. Because space to listen to the spirit is key, and it will be throughout the synod assembly. And yet the listening will not end at the assembly, but there will be some follow-up work between the October 23 assembly and the October 2024 assembly. So again, it's that breathing in and breathing out of the church together. Second point, participation, right? You know, it's been noted for many times that while all the delegates will have a vote, for the first time in this synod, about 26% of the voting members will be non-bishops. That is laity, clergy, religious women, religious men. Half of the continental delegates are women. And that was asked with intention. Noteworthy too is that all of us participating in the synod, voting delegates as well as facilitators and experts are all involved, it's mandatory, in preparatory sessions. And there is spiritual preparation as well as practical preparation. We are going through the documents. We're reflecting on them together. We're meeting with one another. My own preparation as a facilitator expert includes the continental preparation sessions. Some of them have been in person, some online sitting in on UISG and USG members are all in their own preparations and also attending the sessions for the experts and facilitators. We're all being asked to prepare and to be praying with all of this. Another interesting point at the Senate will be how the documents will be written. 
We will be in small groups uh, through, throughout and then in plenary sessions. I'll speak to that. But each group will offer their reports from their discussions, from their discernment. At other times, at times somebody would have been just selected for the group. Would you please write? You took notes. Would you write on our behalf? This is different. There will be a group writing, and throughout the writing process, the small group will be engaged. And ultimately, what is agreed upon by all will be named, as well as the areas that are still held in tension and not resolved. Time will be allotted for this. They've been very intentional about time. Three, prayer. Prayer is absolutely essential in this process. Without it, honestly, we'll be lost. All will participate in the ecumenical prayer service, right? organized by Taizé on September 30th, with Pope Francis also attending it. And actually, all of you um, online streaming will be available, but also your, those of you in Rome are invited to come in person. Many young people will be here for this and a whole weekend of speaking about and engaging together on synodality and what that means. And we'll have at the end of our session today, Brother Matthew from Taizé offering you an invitation and some more information about this. Prayer, something unique here also, it's the first time a synod is beginning with a retreat. And this is a three-day retreat with both Timothy Ratcliffe, the Dominican, and Maria Ignazia Angelini, a Benedictine, presiding, presenting. All are being asked to bring their Bible to retreat. <clears throat> so in every area of preparation, we're reminded that the Holy Spirit is the protagonist. And without the Spirit, the process can't work. <clears throat> Thus, the listening asked for is to be attentive and often steeped in a hope beyond what we can even imagine. And so we're asking you, all of you, our family, friends, community, coworkers, for prayers. We pray this route together this way. Fourth point is about the sessions. Uh, for the first time throughout this, we will be at circular tables rather than in an auditorium style seating. They've literally built circle tables for this event. We'll be within language groups but there will be diversity at tables. So it will not be laity at one table, bishops at another, and religious at another. Everyone will be interspersed across countries, across generations, cultures, and it's very intentional. And when we move from communion to participation uh, to mission, we will also be mixed in different small groups. The goal is to encounter one another and to hear from any, as many voices as possible, right? So there will be the small groups and then the large plenary sessions. Fifth point is communal discernment. The particular method used during the synod will be conversation in the spirit. And some of you will have the opportunity to engage in this today, to be invited. Many UISG and USG members institutes already use forms of communal discernment, at least in your general chapters. Going forward, um, you have much to offer in your local churches and ministries by sharing some of our practices, and yet as well to gain much by the experiences of others. The facilitators at the Synod, and particularly for the small groups, will have as a significant task to hold the sacred space for this conversation in the spirit. To, as Pope Francis has said, speak with paris, parisia and with humility. Parisia meaning boldly and without fear. This is part of the reason that there's so much emphasis right now on holding the sacred space for the sharing to be done. So that it's not to hold back information in the small groups, but to allow room for honest dialogue without the media and external analysis and interference. 
Bishop Alexander Jolie of Troy echoed Pope Francis as saying that, quote, this is not a political event, but a spiritual one in the spirit. The call is to be listening to the spirit away from polemics while holding the questions that have been expressed by the faithful throughout the synodal process. So how do we have such discernment without honest engagement in a safe space? In order to listen to the spirit, which can surprise us all beyond our imagining, right? That's the call. So these are just five of the notable pieces. And if we move to the next slide, please. Sister Pat already mentioned the kind of dialogue of vulnerability means that you're open to be changed. You're open to be engaged. That requires that open heartedness, which is about courage to say, how do I listen to you and allow myself to hear your voice and your vision and the spirit in you? How do we have dialogue through the tensions, which in many parts of the world are difficult? How do we hold the unity of being church amidst the diversity and acknowledge that some of this living out will be different in different places in the church? So again, it's a reminder of communal discernment and of need for conversation in the spirit. If you can move us to the next slide. Um, Sister Pat also mentioned this, and I have to say it was a privilege to be at this assembly listening in 2022, because I, even when the, this, this commitment came forth, I, it took a little bit to realize what a prophetic statement this is, what a call of the Spirit this is. The members of UISG make a commitment to live vulnerable synodality through service as a leader animating it within the community and together with the people of God. That's quite profound and quite challenging. And we at UISG realize that that's our call too, as an organization, as a community. But it's also the call to all of us in religious life and beyond. So thank you. Next slide. All right. We're moving now to sharing from our panelists on the first synod topic. And it's the topic of a communion that radiates. And each of our panelists were invited to reflect on those three questions. We're gonna go back to the, pan to the slide, please, just so you see the questions. Um, this is the, when I said in each section, there are five questions. They were, they were invited to reflect on this from their experience uh, in their different ministries at, as religious, as members of their congregations. And it's asking, and we're all being asked, how does the service of charity and commitment to justice and care for our common home nourish communion in a synodal church? How can a synodal church make credible the promise that love and truth will meet? How can a dynamic relationship of gift exchange between the churches grow? How can a synodal church fulfill its mission through a renewed ecumenical commitment? And how can we recognize and gather the richness of the cultures and develop dialogue among religions in the light of the gospel? And that is only the first part, the first set of questions that the synod will take on. And I'm being told I'm talking too quickly, so I will try to let them catch up. What I will do now is introduce our three panelists in the order in which they will share. And then each one will share. And we will have a moment, a minute of silence to just soak in what they've been saying. Maybe I need to give you a minute of silence to soak in what you've heard thus far.
Sister Shalini Mulakal is a presentation sister, working as coordinator of the Formator Program here at UISG uh, since July. Before this, she has been a professor of systematic theology, Vidyati, a Jesuit theological faculty at New Delhi, India. Our second presenter is Brother Mark Hilton, who currently serves his community, the Brothers of the Sacred Heart, as Superior General. His community has an apostolate focused on the formation of the young, and they serve in 31 countries worldwide. Brother Mark has served as a teacher of science and religious studies, a campus minister, and a principal of schools in Australia and the United States. And for the past 10 years, has served his community in leadership roles. Sister Yolanta Kafka, who will be online with us, is a Claritian missionary sister of Mary Immaculate. She has coordinated youth ministry and spirituality groups and has served as Superior General until 2023. In that time, she's accompanied the foundation of new missionary communities. Sister Yolanta was appointed as advisor to the Pontifical Commission for Interreligious Dialogue, and she's held the position of president of the UISG until 2022. So we have much wisdom to glean from our three panelists, and we begin with Sister Shalini. Namaste. The God in me greets the God in you. This is a greeting of communion, acknowledging that we are united in the same God. I come from a land which gave birth to many religions, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Sikhism, besides the religions of the Dalits, the so-called low caste people, and of the Adivasis, the indigenous people of India. My country welcomed other religions such as Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and also the followers of Baha'i religion. From being a nation that was welcoming, accepting, respecting uh, other religious traditions, today, unfortunately and sadly, we are becoming more and more intolerant nation. There are not only inter-religious conflicts, but also intra-religious conflicts. Even within a religion, there are groups in conflict. Divisions exist even within our own church. Clericalism, the major issue plaguing the church today, creates a situation of division and not of communion. Gender inequality, in a similar way, is an example of lack of communion within the church. This is not all. There is division and disunity everywhere, be it in our own homes, maybe our religious communities, our neighborhood, and the world at large. Yet, in the depth of our hearts, we all long for communion. Most of us would have experienced what a disturbance it causes in the absence of communion when we are cut off from our dear ones, when our relationships are broken. It is in this context that communion, the first sub-theme of the Synod, becomes very significant. Therefore, as a woman religious, I dwell on the question, that is overall question we have already seen, how can we more fully assign 
and instrument of union with God and of the unity of all humanity. We believe in a Trinitarian God. The very essence of God is communion. The church is the mystery of communion. Christian life itself is a communion with God and with the fellow beings. God's plan for humanity from the very beginning was communion. That's why, according to the second creation story, the woman was created because the man was lonely. He needed someone to be in communion with. God desired and labored to build Israel into a community. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that effort of God sending them judges, sending them prophets. But often, it ended in failure. But this desire of God was fulfilled when the early Christian community was formed after the Pentecost. As consecrated persons, we are called to live in communities. A religious community stands as a sign of what the church is meant to be. Building community and staying in communion with other members is not easy. All of us who are living in communities, we know that. It is not easy. It is not a finished product. Day in and day out, we labor for it. It is difficult. It is challenging. But community is not only for mission, but today we understand community is mission. Religious communities, which are often intercultural, international, and intergenerational, can be a powerful sign of communion. In spite of all the differences, we religious can live in communion if you are in communion with God. We need to spend quality time in silence and solitude daily, growing in our relationship with God. I come from a country where people are familiar with saints and sages from other religious traditions who devote their entire life in search of God, who travel very far and meditate for many years and these men and women are seen as men and women of God. Unfortunately, we Christian religious, Catholic religious in India are not often seen as men and women of God. Of course, we are recognized for our contribution to education, to health ministry, to social work and all our charitable endeavors. I am not sure about religious in other parts of the world, how they are perceived by ordinary people. Are we seen as women and men of prayer, of deep communion with God? If not, how can we improve the quality of our presence as women and men of God? As a religious, I also need to introspect my attitude towards others. Do I really respect the other, irrespective of his her nationality, race, ethnicity, color, religion, gender, occupation, educational qualification and the like? Only by consciously rooting out such discriminating tendencies from my heart can I become more fully a sign and instrument of union with God and of the unity of all humanity. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just pause to reflect on what we've heard.
Brother Mark. Recently, reflecting on uh, the readings of the day in First Thessalonians, I was struck by a quote that seemed to echo some things of the Synod. It says, with such affection for you, we were determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very selves as well. So dearly beloved have you become to us. So to form this communion, to form this great vision of the people of God, we are called to love, respect, hope in, trust, and call forth our companions on the journey, the beloved of God. And so we bring our collective and individual experience to this discussion of the synod, as religious, as men and women of the church, as followers of Jesus. In our own case, our founder was constantly hounded by the brothers to write a rule. And he answered, it's better for the rule to be drawn from your experience. Take the time to write it. How could I ever write a rule that might best answer your situation? That openness and attentiveness to the situation to responding to the circumstances of our mission, to being in dialogue and learning from experience has marked our own history, thankfully. External rules and structures may aid the church, but they will not create the fire at its core necessary for that divine life to pour forth in mission to all. As we confront the many questions of the Synod around each theme, and specifically this theme of communion, I'm somewhat more drawn to the attitudes and values that underpin an answer rather than the answers themselves. Those answers will necessarily respond to time and place. At the press conference to release the text for the Synod, I was struck by Cardinal Hollerick's response to a journalist. Uh, the journalist had it all solved. LGBTQ, divorce, abortion, it was simple. Repent, be converted, and then you can be part of the church. Toe the line. I was grateful for his answer. Maybe we are called far more to follow the encounter between Jesus and Zacchaeus, to welcome the lost, to respect them, to truly encounter them where they are, to love them as they are in the hope of their transformation. So my first hope for this synod is that our learning comes from experience, from the wonder of our encounters. In my community, as a community of educators around the world, our mission has been to roll up our sleeves, plunge into the communities of which we are a part, into relationship, and all that are involved, including ourselves, might be transformed by the sweat of our brow, the model of our lives, and the closeness of our accompaniment. Even our religious habit was designed to have rolled up sleeves working in the vineyard of the Lord. In Senegal, our brothers established schools in cities large and small and sometimes in the middle of nowhere in collaboration with the church, with pastors and with bishops. They have a very positive relationship with the Sufi Muslims who form 95% of the population. They welcome them all, educate them, form them. To the extent of that dialogue in Dakar, if you visit our school there, you will find that the mosque across the road is called Sacred Heart Mosque. 
Today in Senegal, there is a vibrant active church, still vastly in the major minority, which has developed in positive relationship with its neighbors. It is valued, encouraged, welcomed, and the brothers, even though small in number, are well known and have held national positions. Thus, from rolling up their sleeves, welcoming all, and allowing the spirit to move among them. Thus, a second step, involvement, the sharing of self. And so as we consider the synod, what values or learning have we drawn from the many documents that others have created along the way? Another hope, or possibly even a dream, is humility. That outpouring of self, the kenosis described in Thessalonians and in Philippians, that is ever necessary for the transformation of ourselves and for those we serve. As Paul said, to share our very selves as modeled in the person of Jesus. In the same press conference, Cardinal Grech, uh, the prefect of the Synod office, was asked about a range of hot button theological issues. His answer helped me understand our purpose in Synod. We are not here to answer the great theological questions of our day. Others tend to that much more than us. We are here to examine, reflect on, and bring to life the pastoral vision of the church to bring about the kingdom that is already among us, to bring to life again the pastoral vision of Gaudium et Spes that has been around at all times, but dimmed by circumstance. As religious, we know the value and life found in church ministry focused on one-to-one -one personal encounter. Each person wants a brother or sister, a teacher, anyone who works at our school, for example, to stop, to listen, to watch, to hear, to value them, know them, respect them, love them. And that can only occur when we are certain that God loves us and humble before that completely unwarranted love and share that love so freely given to us with everyone. What we have been freely given must be freely given away. So I do not think I have an answer as to how all the synod will unfold, how communion will be achieved, but slowly, gently, deliberately, with hope and trust, with joy and song, even conflict and pain, with a humility that values each person, and with a pastoral vision that seeks to encounter all. We may not solve the great theological questions, but maybe, just maybe, when those around us know and feel that they are deeply beloved, the spirit may have its own freedom among us. Thank you. Thank you. We will pause to just reflect on what we've heard and let it sink in.
And now we invite Sister Yolanta, and she'll be speaking in Spanish. Yes, I do. <laughs> Muy buenas tardes. Hello. Hello to you all. It is a true pleasure for me to be here with you all. And I will share something that starts from the experience, my experience of cooperation in our WISG. And I would like also to talk about my charism, my love for the church, the importance of a constant renovation, the synod is an expression of this process that is crucial. Reading the Instrumentum Laboris, I was touched by a sentence. It is important to build communion, accepting that the horizon of perfect unity is in front of us. We will never achieve it fully in history. And this is an expression that is very humble. It is so humble and it relates to communion our communion with God that shall be developed constantly. We shall restore it, we shall renew it constantly. And so communion is an expression, the expression of the great desires of God towards the humanity, but it is also a task, a quest that is constant. And the Instrumentum Laboris has got a few expressions that reflect these paths. For example, in the questions we got references to the borders that we shall overcome. What kind of refugees and safe areas are we supposed to uh, build to protect the others? What are the divisions that are not fruitful? and so on and so forth. And so, there is an expression that is very important. Building communion requires the acceptance of a lack of com our completeness. We are not complete and we shall accept it and we shall journey in diversity. So, we shall accept our being, the fact that we are not complete, and we shall remember that we shall join in communion with others. Our incompleteness means something that is very specific for us, consecrated people. It is important to recall that communion is an horizon and our church explains that consecrated life, religious life, is a school, a school of communion. And so what incompleteness are we referring to? First of all, I would like to say that we shall recognize that our being incomplete relates to our charisms. All charisms are fruits of the Gospels, but no charism can contain all the riches of the Gospel. So we need the others, we need each other, and peace brings hope for the intercongregational exchange of charism and for learning from each other in a natural way because we are not owners of our charism. It is a spiritual gift that is about communion. We know that WISG and WUSG 
together of platforms of this exchange, of this enriching sharing, of this common search beyond our circle as consecrated people to enrich the church and to enrich us with the church. And we shall recall that we are incomplete also in our ecclesial experiences. We will talk about it in our following meeting. We want to stress that the way in which we celebrate liturgy, our spirituality, uh, the influence of spirituality on life is something that exists and it is a true richness because it is a fruit a fruit of the infinite creativity of the holy spirit so the spirit we could say that invites us to learn new ways of contemplating his action and we shall recognize it without fear diversity is our engine invites us to learn from the others with patience with listening i believe that we as consecrated are invited to a new school of contemplation a school in which we shall contemplate the action of the spirit in the church praying with the church recognizing the action of the spirit please recall the synodal question in what way god is manifested among us and we know that diversity is also about pain among us among religious institutions among congregations among us as consecrated people we feel pain the pain of diversity the, the pain of hidden missions the pain of minorities there are congregations that suffer because they are too little we should open our windows as religious we should look around us in our conferences in our communions we should understand who is in need of help in this diversity it is crucial for us to develop a universal fraternity we shall build on food in future on different levels on the pastoral level, on the academic level, we shall leverage these tools we have got to create a movement of equal opportunities throughout the world. In this way, we can build communion with a sensibility of incompleteness it is crucial for us to be experts of synodality and of ecclesial community and communion. To do that, as Sister Pat said at the beginning, we shall ask the Spirit for the gift of communion and we shall brave, be brave enough, resilient enough to be creative with the Spirit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yolanta. Now a few minutes to ground some ideas. Thank you. 
We invite you now to look at those reflection questions that will come to your slide. And we'll put the beautiful Vani Sante Spiritus back for a few minutes. But to just invite you um, for your for the process we will do next, and I'll explain it, but I first want to offer just some minutes of quiet. Um, what did you hear that drew you? What draws you in what you've heard so far? Or you can also choose one of these questions about communion um, that will be engaged. So what attracts your heart, your spirit, your mind? And we'll have a few minutes of quiet and then I'll explain the next piece. And now we invite you uh, 
uh, with whatever reflections have, have gathered to you within you at this moment, um, to this particular way uh, of, of having the conversation, the sharing. And it's in the next slide, which is about conversation in the spirit. And so some would call it spiritual conversation, but it's, it's conversation in the spirit. It's a way of sharing with one another that allows for depth of reflection and movement within you. This is the process we will be using um, during the synod. And more and more congregations are using this in their local communities, in their provinces, in their gatherings. So uh, it's, it's an opportunity here to use it with this group gathered. There are three rounds, and the question is basically, what attracts you? What is drawing you about communion, about what you're hearing? The first round, and you'll be in small groups, the first round of sharing is your own response to the panel or the questions. And maybe one minute, two minute max, uh, try to respect that with one another and maybe somebody could be a timekeeper. Um, and there are no comments at this point. So just hearing what draws each person. After everyone has spoken, the second round is what did you hear from one another in the group? Not more of what you're thinking about what you heard from the panel, um, which I'm so grateful and thank our, our sisters Yolanta and Shalini and brother Mark. Um, but not just that, but the second round is what did you hear from the six or eight of you or those gathered? What's drawing you? And again, no comment. The third round then is, what are we in this group hearing that we can share? What's the one insight, maybe two? What one insight from what you together are hearing, which could be something totally new than what you said in round one and two? What are you hearing that you would then share with the large group. And here I ask if there would be one person in each group um, who would volunteer to just write it in a sentence or a few phrases. When we get back to the large group, you'll be invited while the music is playing to write it in the chat. So again, we'll have silence, but you'll share your wisdom in the chat. And those of you gathered here, We'll try to make sure there's a piece of paper so that you could give it to us and then we'll read it, all right? So that's the, the piece of it, the conversation in the spirit. We'll have 30 minutes in your small groups uh, and in the online groups, the hope is that you've put the language uh, that you're connected to most comfortably so that you can be in the appropriate group. Um, but you'll have 30 minutes. It'll be marked up there as well. And then we'll bring you to the large group. Thank you. from group nine. We heard and shared with you. Personal count encounter is essential. Taking time to listen, care about the individuals right before us. We are all incomplete. We are committed to remaining on the path toward the horizon of communion, nourished by our daily prayer and allowing God to love us so that we can freely love others. Another, our vulnerability enables the embrace of our incompleteness 
and opens us to the diversity of gifts before us. The vision of communion will be realized in our walking together. We are experiencing the synodal approach as essentially a pastoral one. Rules will not create the fire, letting the spirit in will. Communion draws us. Loneliness is an experience among others which leads us to seek and counter, and it needs synodal attention. The process is unfolding and evolving. Communion calls us to transformation and we are made whole. It leads us to share our gifts and to, to oneness with other congregations, religions worldwide, and God's creation. It is about relationships. Vulnerability means that I am open to be changed. The synodal process is calling us to a new heart set focusing on the why, why we do it, which takes us to a new depth and meaning of encounter with God, others, and all creation. An image of open door or open doors similar to the windows opening at Vatican II. Empowered by the spirit in our incompleteness, in a spirit of humility, we acknowledge our incompleteness and embrace our diversity as we strive for communion and completeness. Hope is a gift of the Spirit. We commit to moving with the Spirit and commit to the synodal movement toward communion. We are on the way together waking up to the gift of what is already and yet to be realized. We dare to believe and trust God's power to make cosmic, universal communion visible among us, healing us to be courageous in forming previously unimagined, transformative healing relationships beyond past barriers, being one in communion. Y en español, por favor. In Spanish. Well, we've got in Spanish here a few affirmations, a few statements. It is necessary to have faith to live synodality. We shall believe that the others are made following the image of God. Contemplative listening, it is crucial for us to ground these reflections on the practice and we shall remember that we shall convert ourselves synodality and communion should go hand in hand there are a few contributions also online here for example a few statements We should be a sign of communion starting from our uh, synodality. We shall be humble to generate and build hope, a hope that shall generate a change that is constant in our world. We should embrace our incompleteness with humility to feel the need of others with naturality and we shall feel the action of the Lord in us. We shall be women of our Lord and witness of witnesses of communion. The main sign of unity is what we see in our approach towards our sisters when we recognize that we are not complete we shall build communion 
and we shall understand that we are not complete and that we need this completeness. The reflection generated hope. We are journeying together in a single way and we are committed to uh, be a space that helps us journey together with others. Thank you for this space that helps us enlarge the space of our tent. We can be a full sign of communion and unity with God, recognizing that we are small, that our charism is a charism that uh, is grounded on the Gospels. So when we uh, abandon these trends that are discriminatory, we can be a sign of communion on all different levels. So we shall revise, we shall see if we are truly men of God, we shall be men of God, we shall discover the meaning of our incompleteness, we need the others to grow in our humil humility. We need to accept others, uh, to accept the vulnerability of each and every one of us. How can we mature ourselves to uh, embrace the others? En français? Communion is mission. They are not separated from each other. Listening allows us to live the experience of our vulnerability and to be in need of others. The sentence that what touched us the most is that communion is mission. Listening helps us not to be, not to prejudge. The question that touched us the most was the dialogue in mutual listening, diversity, prayer, humbleness. Because communion is a gift of the Spirit, we need as well perseverance and patience in light of communion. God created man and women for communion to complete one another, to go towards the other with a sense of happiness, amazement. Communion is a mission. Being incomplete in our charism is the path to communion. The invite to the invitation to be transformed is very enriching. The fruit of the communion is that those who surround us need to feel profoundly loved. The horizon of the, the perfect unity is in front of us. Listening is a gift, and the link that keeps it together is to be built day by day. This is everything for the French part. So inspired by the meeting with Zach, we are invited to recognize our vulnerability in front of the hunger of communion, we are invited to move forward in a position of hope to enlarge our way of living communion in the community. We became aware of how important and essential the sacred space for the Holy Spirit is as the protagonist of who we are, 
and God wants us to be and become on the journey of the synodal path. This requires humility, sincerity, awareness of shared responsibility. That is, it requires a new way of listening, walking, and being together. And there are many more, there are many more. So I thank you for this. I thank you for this experience of sharing. And two last pieces, if we may just beg a few more minutes. Uh, we have Brother Matthew from Taizé community here, who will in December, I think, uh, become the, uh, uh, the, the leader in the, uh, Manas in the community of Taizé. And he's been here for the last few months working uh, with a team of other members uh, of Taize and volunteers on the program that will be for the weekend of September 30th. So Brother Matthew, we invite you here. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Maria, for your welcome. Um, it's true, these last 18 months have been quite something for us preparing this ecumenical prayer vigil. Our prior brother Alois was at the opening of the Synod in October 2021, and when he spoke, he shared what for him was very important, the necessity of uh, moments of breathing during the Synodal journey, that it not just be times of discussion, but that there'd be times for prayer together. And also that it would be possible for Christians from other denominations, other churches, to take part in this journey. And he said, Pope Francis invites us to dream. I have a dream of a gathering of the people of God on St. Peter's Square, um, of Christians of different traditions who would pray uh, for the synodal journey. And this dream was taken seriously so now we have to prepare it um, and on the uh, 30th of september um, there will be from five o'clock in the evening until seven o'clock in saint peter's square um, this gathering of the people of god in which will take place we shall take part pope francis but also patriarch bartholomew of constantinople archbishop justin welby of canterbury um, and 20 other different heads of churches. Yeah? Together with the, all the synodal participants, it will be the start of their retreat together. And also people from uh, different language groups here in Rome, people from the margins of society here in Rome, and around 4,000 young adults who will be coming from all over Europe and a little further afield as well to take part in a weekend of events which Teze, together with um, many different partners, um, have prepared. And for Teze, it's also been a synodal journey. We understood right from the beginning that it was very important for us to listen to other communities, listen to other movements in order to understand what the Spirit is saying to us all today. And the program is a result of that listening. If you look at the program of workshops for the Saturday morning, you will see that there's nothing led by a Teze brother. It's all led by other communities, other, other groups. Um, there will be a time of praise and worship with our charismatic partners in St. John Latran um, at midday. And then we will all walk together, sin hodos, the same path. Uh, we will walk together from St. John Latran to St. Peter's uh, for the gathering. The square will be open from 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so for those who don't want to walk, you can go immediately to the, 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 the vigil in, in, in St. Peter's. And perhaps just to say as well that we realize that many people won't be able to come to Rome. Yeah? So there are over 120 events taking place throughout the world on all the continents, surrounding the start of the Synod in a network of prayer, entrusting the work of the Synod to the Holy Spirit, as Pope Francis asked us when he made this announcement on the 16th of January after the Angelus. 
And if you need more information, there's a dedicated website, uh, www.together2023.net. Um, and it's in six languages, so I hope everybody will be able to understand. But please pray for this initiative. Not everything is resolved yet. Um, and, and we count on your prayer and on your presence. Uh, please spread the word among your communities. Um, everybody is welcome. St. Peter's Square is very large. Yes, yes, it's perhaps also important to say for those of you who are further away that uh, Vatican News, uh, Vatican Media, sorry, will live stream the event from 4.30 Rome time through until 7 o'clock on the 30th of, of September on their YouTube channel. And this will probably be taken up by other um, uh, channels as well in France, Cateo, uh, they, they, will, they will cover it and in other countries, I think, as well, it'll be taken up. Thank you. Um, it's entrance free, ticket free. Yeah. And in our small group, um, the sister had a very important idea that she shared with us. Um, because when you go to these gatherings, the tendency is for people of the same congregation all to sit together. We Teze brothers, there'll be 50 of us, but we're going to split up into small groups of two or three to mix with everybody. And, and I think that's a very beautiful challenge for us all, yeah, to mix with others, to mix with the people of God, to have the smell of the sheep, as Pope Francis says. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Matthew. I think it's an important uh, part of just the journey we all have together. And so those of you who are here in Rome, please, please join. Meet the young people. Meet one another uh, across the, the people of God. And those of you who are uh, able to be online, it's 5 to 7 p.m. Roman time. So uh, if you change it as you go. Uh, just a thank you to everyone who made this happen. Uh, it's my first time here at UISG working on this project. So it took the communication team, the administration, uh, Rosalia to print a million things. Uh, we tried to be good though. Uh, and, and just everyone in there, we thank the interpreters uh, for their time and talent in this. And so everyone who's part of this, the tech team. And uh, we, just to give you a sense of a head, on September 25th will be the second of these gatherings. And we will be looking at the area of mission and also inviting people to reflect on the different continental documents. So you come from all over. So to bring that wisdom as well. And then the, the third session before the Senate on the 29th, we will be looking at participation, and there we will be inviting the delegates from UISG and USG to share on that topic, those who will be attending the Synod that UISG and USG have elected, so invited. So please put this on your calendar at the same times. Uh, you are most welcome. and. Uh, uh, muchas gracias, merci beaucoup, grazie mille, and have a wonderful rest of your day, wherever it is. Thank you.